Hey guys, um, this is a very exciting uh, release for me because there is a whole bunch of stuff that I really wanted to fix on the Pyrebit backend uh, to get prepared for the next round of the updates to the tools. Um, there are a couple of things that were really important, like for example, I wanted to work on the Keynote Manager as a um, sort of like a non-modal window that you can always keep open and add the keynotes and stuff as you're working in your Revit model. Right now you have to open it every time you want to add keynotes. Uh, but I really wanted to get to a point that I can uh, improve the keynote manager to be non-modal and sort of like always uh, go through the, um, the requests and updates that are coming through the um, Pyramid uh, issue tracker and update the tools. But a lot of them needed me to be able to clean up the, uh, some of this stuff, some of the mess that's inside the, um, inside the Pyramid core. And uh, this release, the better two release, is very exciting for me because it has, it has a couple of features that are really, um, really, really necessary in um, reusing Pyrobit in a larger environment. Pyrobit is getting a little bit more um, uh, attention. And then uh, there are some of these features that really help uh, large organizations use Pyrobit and sort of like um, deploy it in a, in a consistent manner and um, that, that kind of stuff. So. Um, I want to, in this quick video, uh, I want to talk about an overview of the changes that are coming in the 4.7 final. This is obviously the second beta. I want you guys out to test it and then um, figure out, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And then for the final release in about a month, um, I'll do a complete video that explains all these features and stuff like that. But from then on, uh, this video is basically just an overview. And throughout the course of next week, next two weeks, I'll issue, I'll publish videos that specifically talk about some of these new features, like the private telemetry system. It needs its own video to sort of like explain the setup and all that kind of stuff around it. Um, so let's quickly talk about some of these changes. Um, first of all, very exciting news. Pyramid has a new home. Uh, so from now on, if you open wiki.pyramidlabs.io, it'll take you to this uh, sort of like Notion workspace that looks like that looks like this. Uh, I'm actually going to close my Notion and open it from Firefox to sort of like show you guys the way um, you would see it. So let's do um, Pyramid Lab, uh, actually wiki, the Pyramid Labs.io. Okay, so this is what you will see when you look at the uh, sort of like pirate, new pirate home. Um, the pirate blogs will be rerouted to sort of like to point to this place. Um, it has a lot of information on the sort of like the front side of it. There's getting started using Pyrobit and getting started developing for Pyrobit. Um, there are directions on how to install, sort of like resolve the install issues and whatnot, use some of the most you know advanced and uh, sort of like most popular tools. Uh, there's a little bit of how-to guides in here. And then on the development side, it takes you through creating your first command, the developer documentation that we get through, the documentation for the Pyrobit CLI, and then a specific category for uh, people that want to manage Pyrobit in large teams. Uh, information about staying updated. Finally, after all these years, I have a roadmap for Pyrovit. If you go inside this, you'll see this next release that's coming up and uh, sort of like the features that are completed right now and um, will be moved into the beta tested as you guys test it out. And then the rest of these features that I'm working on completing for the full final release. And then we have a backlog of uh, requested features and the other stuff that are coming up in the next uh, 4.8 version. So you'll see the progress on the um, on Pyrobit uh, in, a, in a sort of like a decent manner. The old blog is basically moved here. So all the blog posts, the old blog posts are placed inside this category and I'll start publishing new content in here. But most of the times um, in the old times when I had the blog, I would publish information the stuff that I wanted you you to know, I would publish them on the blog. Like for example, there was uh, the last article that I posted is about uh, extracting project information from the Revit file. These stuff they don't have to be in blog posts anymore. They have a place that I'll show you where they go. They go into the developer documents and sort of like they have a better place to go now. There's some information about dealing with issues and then getting involved. Uh, the community. Uh, there's a list that's just me on the list right now, but any of you that are contributor to the sort uh, to the private core, let me know. Uh, send me a text message on the um, on the Twitter or anywhere else that you can contact me. Let me know that you are okay to include your information in here and sort of like send me some of these stuff and I'll add you here as part of the private community, developer community. And then if you want to share your passion, help uh, us uh, get the documentation better, translate Pyrobit, uh, create tutorials and your build numbers, whatever you get a new build number for Revit, uh, wherever in the world you are. Share your code if you want to help us improve the uh, Pyrobit and then the coins uh, if you want to financially support the private project on Patreon, uh, the rest of this stuff are here. 
so one of the most important aspects of this new home is the documentation for developers, for you guys that really want to develop um, uh, for Pyravid and on Pyravid. Um, you, some of the users might have noticed that a huge part of uh, sort of like my efforts is towards the developer community on, on Pyravid. For me, Pyravid has always been a um, rapid application development environment uh, for, for Revit. Actually, let me close this. I'm keep... um, I've always been a rapid application prototyping environment for Autodesk Revit. Um, the, the, true purpose, the true purpose of the Pyravid project and the true uh, sort of like power of it is to make it very easy to develop for Autodesk Revit uh, and deploy these two to tools. Obviously, it comes with a set of the tools. Um, I am really sorry that I can't really uh, sort of like focus 100% of my time on improving the existing tools and taking care of those issues that are show up on the GitHub. I do it in sort of like a um, uh, uh, sort of like a periodical, um, periodical fashion. So I focus on core for a while and then I move on to the tools when I know the core is ready that can support the changes to the tools. So it's, I have to sort of move back and forth between these two domains. Um, but the first and foremost uh, sort of like functional part of it for me is to be this um, uh, rapid prototyping environment for Revit. And the rest of it is all the tools that I use daily at my work as well. So anyway, uh, with that, developer documents is for you. If you are developing for Pyravid, yeah, there's a quick explanation of how Pyravid works, creating your first command, cpython command, dot then command, and I'll get to these when we talk about the new features, your first hook, sharing extension and bundles. There is a link to the videos on the YouTube channel on how to start developing for Pyravid, for um, Pyravid and Revit in Python. Uh, the All the concepts around the Pyravid bundles, Pyravid metadata, the bundle metadata, bundle, uh, bundle context, bundle layout, and I'll get to these in a second, sort of like just to show an overview. The lib and bin directories inside the bundle, and then the extension bundles, which is a very specific type of bundles in PyRevit or extensions. They can include all sorts of other bundles inside them. And then their metadata, startup uh, script, hooks, and sort of like it takes you through all these scripts, what you need uh, for the RM Python scripts, CPython scripts, .NET, hooks, extensions, the different click modes that you have for the buttons. Uh, some of you might have noticed that you can, I don't know, like shift click on a button or control click on a button, and you would get different results depending on the functionality that's provided by, the, by that command. And uh, there are really good, two really good articles that are sort of like expanded these two, the effective output and effective input. The effective output shows you a lot of like features of the output window that you can utilize to sort of like present information in a better way to your, um, to your uh, sort of like, you know, users. And the effective input is the one that uh, sort of talks about the, uh, the special forums that Pyramid has that you can uh, prompt to the user, ask questions, ask for options, send a toast notification like that, for example, on Windows 10, uh, and sort of like show progress bars and, you know, ask for sheets and schedules and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's that. And then the visualizing data has always been that particle about charts, creating different chart types. Uh, so it's still there. And uh, we'll talk about the .NET script facilities and whatnot. The, port, uh, the core talks about the core uh, features, the core configuration, the configuration file, the distribution model of Pyravid, the deployments that we have, the different types of deployments, depending on what features of Pyravid you really want to have, the, uh, the Pyravid CLI, the Pyravid runtime that runs your and executes your commands inside the, Pyravid, inside the Revit environment, and the new amazing Pyravid telemetry system. Um, so this, all that information is here. And then the Pyravid APIs, I'm gonna, these are sort of like work in progress right now, but this is the place that uh, I'm gonna put all the information about all these APIs that are inside the Pyravid and uh, sort of like tool chain that are available to you. Like for example, Pyravid ships with a .NET module and a Python module that uh, you've all been using. For example, this is the documentation for the Python module. Um, that sort of like, you know, you can go through and uh, take a look at. Um, I'm doing a cleanup on these before the 4.7. So all these articles have been moved to the new home now. This page would only be about like so looking at these um, sort of like Python modules and seeing the documentation on the functions and whatnot. Um, so this, this section is only about the APIs and then all the new APIs that are coming up, like the telemetry server, server API, the Pirate Labs API, um, the uh, sort of like uh, the labs, the the sort of like the, those binaries that get in, uh, shipped inside the bin directory inside the um, Pyravid installation, the, the um, API about those. Like if you want to uh, extract Revit file information in your own applications, you can use these APIs to sort of like, you know, work with them. 
And then the some information about the private source, like checklists about building and whatnot. The goal of this space workspace is to be a shared environment for all the um, private core developers from now on, uh, that they can sort of like upgrade these documents and have checklists and whatever they have to do on for like creating releases and stuff like that. Explanation of how the source works and whatnot. And then those articles that I mentioned, like uh, Revit file as a uh, structured storage, the uh, project information stream, the part atom, the uh, basic files info, these were blog posts on the previous blog, but now they have a uh, sort of like a decent place under the articles inside the um, dev um, uh, sort of like developer docs in here. Um, and then the, the, the one of the two most important aspects of this that we're going to talk about is a private CLI help. So all the uh, CLI functionality, you know, managing your private clones and stuff using the CLI has been moved to here. Uh, previously, they were all placed inside the repo and sort of like combined with that um, uh, read the docs documentation and stuff. All of these, all of these um, components of Pyramid Online experience have one single source of truth now. So you can just come in, come in directly to here and um, sort of like get the information that you need. And then all the information about the telemetry system that I'll show you are also placed inside this uh, documentation, and it takes you through the setup and how does it work and all that kind of stuff. I'll touch on these um, in, a, in a sort of like an, um, as an overview, and then I'll show you how it works and whatnot, and you can read the articles and get it set up on your on your systems. Um, so let's go to the. So we talked about the private home, the developer docs roadmap, and the new home. Basically, um, there are some breaking changes. Make sure to go through all this list. Everything that uh, I've introduced as breaking, you will get a deprecate message as you are loading your new um, uh, sort of like 4.7 beta 2 with your existing extensions. You get a deprecate message, like for example, the active view uh, a property of the Revit object is now uh, renamed to active underscore view, just to um, sort of like make it uh, consistent across the whole um, private code base. And then some changes to, to the uh, pick messages. And then the stack two and the stack three bundles have renamed into the stack. They're both the same. Now Pyrovid is understands. Pyrovid has always sort of like been a smart about whether there are two tools or three tools. Uh, it's just one of those legacy things that has been in Pyrovid that I finally got a chance to get to get rid of. And then the link button, uh, the sort of like the, I don't know if you have used this feature or not, but previously you could uh, specify assembly and command class in a Python uh, script to sort of like launch an, another add-on. These stuff have been moved away, uh, moved out of the pirate. The layout file has been deprecated. There's a new bundle metadata that I'll touch on. And then the um, zero documents, like stuff like this, just read through all this. And um, I'm officially dropping the support for any Revit that's older than 2016. Uh, that doesn't mean that the Pyramid doesn't work on them. Uh, I still test the Pyramid just to make sure that it loads on as far as like as old as 2014. Um, the trouble is that the, the API differences between the new versions of Pirate and the Revit and the old versions are a little bit too much. And then it makes it very hard to make it uh, make even like the, some of the base functionality of the tools really work on these older versions. So some of the tools are breaking right now on uh, 2014, most work. Uh, but officially, as part of the official Pirate development, I'm dropping the support for those because I can't really afford um, testing all these features and stuff on the old Revit versions anymore. Um, there was this feature in it uh, inside the Pirate CLI that's been removed. I didn't really get any feedbacks on them. Nobody seems to be using that feature, so I got rid of it. And uh, let's talk about all the new features. Uh, Pirate has a new, um, let me actually think maybe it's a better place to start with this. Well, yeah, let's go through this this list. It's it's not it's it has no particular order. I'll take you through a diff couple of diff uh, different components and I'll let you figure out uh, the the rest of it from the articles. So Pyramid has a new telemetry system. Um, this feature used to be called the usage logs and it used to exist inside the Pyramid settings. It's still there, but it's now expanded to support a lot more features in it. Um, let me take you through the, here through the Pyramid settings. The rest of the Pyramid looks pretty much as, uh, as before. Uh, we have the uh, sort of like the output settings has been renamed into the UI, user experience, user, interac uh, user interface uh, sort of like section that has the Pyramid language that, you know, we have started translating Pyramid and then the new tab colorizer for Pyramid that we'll get to and the output styling is still here. So the settings are sort of like expanding their their domain, um, this specific, these two sections. But the telemetry that I was talking about, the usage like used to be here. Now it's called telemetry. And it has two major components. Pyramid can send information about each of the scripts, whether they're built-in scripts or your own extensions that's being executed in the Revit environment, 
or about the application events that's happening uh, when you're working with Revit. Like for example, whenever somebody opens a document, um, let's say document opened, um, that's this event. If you click on these links, it'll take you to the API docs that the amazing Guy Talarico has uh, created. Yeah, he was actually very helpful in uh, creating a sort of like a smart URL for me so I can tie these um, these uh, uh, sort of like links based on the Revit version that you're running on to the actual documentation for that uh, for that event version. Um, so you can see through this, and I'll, I'll talk. Uh, I'll take you through it of how uh, basically this is set up. But the the point that I'm trying to make right now is that Pyruvate can send you two different types of uh, telemetry information to the servers that um, I've also I'm, I'm also shipping with Pyruvate um, since since this release. Um, Let's go and I'm going to pause this for a second. Uh, so let's go and take a look at the documentation for Pyruvate telemetry. So it takes you through the telemetry, tells you what telemetry system is that we just talked about. It tells you how to set up the telemetry system, the server that sh gets shipped with Pyruvate. It's a, an executive file that's called Pyruvate telemetry server. It's inside the bin directory. It's a single executive. It doesn't have any dependencies. It's been written and compiled in Go. Uh, in Go language, and you can move it, you know, place it on your server somewhere. It's compiled for Windows 64-bit Windows, and you can, you know, place it there. It runs with no issues and whatnot. It works with uh, the major, the most well-known uh, databases, whether they're relational or document, PostgreSQL, MySQL, SQL Server, SQLite databases, and MongoDB. Um, in this example, I'm going to show you a MongoDB database because it's just, you know, it's easier to set up um, for a presentation. But I have all this information ready inside this article if you want to set up your relational databases as well. Uh, there's some notes about like providing your passwords and whatnot. But basically, what, what you know, what comes it, what it comes down to is that you launch the Pyruvate telemetry server executive, provide the URI of your the connection string of your database. Uh, that in my example would be a MongoDB with the user pass, the local host, whatever that uh, local host, whatever that domain name is for that machine, the IP, and that database that I've created for all this telemetry information. And there are one or two um, outlets for all these um, all these uh, sort of like what is it called the records. They either go to scripts, which is the script telemetry data that we talked about, or they go to events, which is the application events uh, telemetry data that we talked about. And I'll show you both of them here. Um, you'll launch this server, and it's sort of like as you're working with Revit, it, it uh, starts logging all this information on the uh, in your database. Uh, it takes you through how to set it up, provide these paths um, for the um, for the API here. You can use this telemetry server with the older version of um, the um, Pyruvate that you have on your uh, servers right now on your machines as well. Uh, Pyruvate had this usage log and had this feature from many, many versions yet, uh, back, but it wasn't really a complete feature and it wasn't uh, very well advertised. Um, what you see here, the paths point to the V2 version of the API. You can change that to a V1, and I've explained that stuff in this article and the, um, the API, uh, telemetry API as well. So you can change that to the V1 and then start sending the scripts information to this database as well for the older Pyruvate versions. Older Pyruvate versions, however, they don't have the application events that's new to the telemetry system. They don't have this. They don't. They can't push that information. It's only about the script execution. So I very much encourage you to upgrade your Pyruvates, especially if you're managing an in a team environment, and start collecting your data, understand how uh, your users are working, and um, and I'll show you. Uh, it's, it's an amazing set of data that uh, the Pyruvate collects for you um, uh, sort of like uh, to, to be used in your organization. Um, I've placed this on top of this article. Pyruvate I and Pyruvate Labs does not collect your data. This is a this is a feature that's built to um, sort of like support you in your use cases. I don't have a public server that collects this information. It might come in the future, but if that happens, I'll let you all know, and it would be a completely something that's selective. You can choose whether you want to contribute to this um, public information or not. Uh, but this is something that I've built for uh, sort of like you guys to use at your um, at your organization. Uh, make sure that to select or basically select your choice of the UTC timestamps depending on the configurations of your uh, your data analysis systems and the database uh, systems that you have. It takes you through configuring the, the telemetry for the users on the user's machine. Uh, it, it takes you through like the execution code and stuff that are sort of like part of those logs. But let me actually show you what this log looks like for a script. Um, this is the schema two, the version two of the schema. This is the, an example of a data that Pyruvate sends to the server every time you execute a script. It tells you who executed that, what Pyruvate, uh, what Pyruvate version it was been using, what Revit built, Revit version, the timestamp, uh, the different configurations for the engine, 
um, and then uh, for the command basically, and then the commands, the URI, URID for the commands, the bundle for the command, the document that was open, the result code for the command, zero means success, but it was a, uh, if it was an error, you can see there's a link in this document that points to all the result codes that are available. And then all the messages, the trace information, if there is a failure on the engine, it gives you all the information about the engine and the message about the um, sort of like that failure. So you can see all the failure errors are as part of this record that's coming through your telemetry system. This is the legacy schema that I talked about. This is the older version of PyRivets. Anything that's before 4.7 beta 2 uh, sends you a sort of like a, um, a record like this. Um, it's a little bit outdated. It's a little bit old. It separates the um, Python and CLR from each other and whatnot. You might find it useful. You can start using the telemetry system right now in, the system, in your uh, environment with the scripts. And then <clears throat> whenever you're ready to upgrade to 4.7 final, then you can start using the, um, the, uh, the version two of the API. And then it sends you also about the application events that we talked about. On every time there's an application event in Revit, uh, uh, part of it sends you all this information about the user, the host user, the Revit versions, the documents that's open, and the event, the information that comes from the event arguments object that Revit passes on to that event handler. Um, this information that's inside this object that's inside the args, it really depends on the type of event that you're getting it. That's why it's uh, incredibly helpful if you want to sort of like have a no document database as like MongoDB to set up for this. It makes it easier to sort of like search for all this information and not worry about the um, setting it up, setting up the um, uh, what's it called, the relational databases. I have all the information, the DDL um, SQL languages for you know, setting up your tables for the script and uh, the legacy schema and for the application events in here. The ill dump, there's one record that's an event args JSON, so it'll dump all those flexible pieces of this this record as part of as a JSON object inside that um, JSON field. Um, but this is something that obviously if you're using a relational database you have to write your own scripts to be able to uh, or use an anal analysis data analysis framework that understands JSON fields and can sort of like um, open that for you. Like for example you can use Power BI, Microsoft Power BI and read that JSON object out of that um, out of that record and expand it and you know uh, sort of like look into its properties and whatnot. It gives you enough base information that it collects um, that sort of like makes sense, enough enough context that make it really helpful. Like for example, document ID. It's even um, smart enough to extract project number and project name from the actual uh, project information data inside Revit model. This is not part of the, that's, that's typical for all the events that are coming in. Um, it really tries really hard to get all this information to you and then leave the rest of it flexible for the ARCs, um, ARCs uh, argument. And then under the, at the end of this article, it'll take you through the application event arguments for all these different application event types. And it tells you the schema for all this data that's coming through. Like for example, if I wanna um, uh, track the document, let's say document printing, um, it gives me the views, a list of all these views, information about the views, what the type, family, name, and title of the view is, and then all the print settings that are coming from that um, print um, sort of like event handler. Synchronizing with central and everything else around this. So this is what part of the telemetry system is. It's a very powerful system. Um, I think that will support um, sort of like your use cases in your environment. If you go under developer docs and then take a look at the uh, the private APIs, you'll see that the telemetry server REST API is here. And then here, API version two, it gives you the endpoint, the scripts for scripts, and then sort of like takes you through the schema for all of these. And then the API version one is the legacy. The As I mentioned, the path is API slash v1. And then the same, it only supports the scripts and it has the um, schema for it here as well. Obviously this is draft. Uh, it's kind of, these are stuff are kind of subject to change. There's no authentication required for this server at this point. We might something add, add something in the future, but I'll, I'll keep you updated about these, these changes. So let me give you an example of this. Like here I've set it up, uh, I've set up Docker on my machine and I have an um, uh, instance of MongoDB running and I've set up a database which I'm calling PyRoid inside the MongoDB environment uh, database and let me actually launch this and take a look at all these records. So I have this database with the two collections, events and uh, scripts. And I'm gonna open this and I see that I have a whole bunch of like records coming in. Let's go and delete all of these. Um, so it's fresh and new. Okay, um, so I'm going to here and launch this server and it says start listening. I'm gonna to go to my machine. I've already uh, sort of like configured part of it with these paths to the to the telemetry server for the um, APIs and everything. But let's see, if I change this document, uh, see it tells me view activated. Um, a different view was activated. 
And, uh, oh, actually, you know, we have this record when I close the settings command as well. So private core settings has been executed by me. That's the timestamp, and it gives me all this information. Now, if I go to the uh, here and then refresh, you'll see that object coming in for uh, that record. So if I go here and show it in JSON, that's all the information that you saw, uh, sort of like the record for that execution in here. Um, MongoDB document databases provide an, uh, sort of like ID for this. Um, if you are using a relational database, the, uh, the, um, the pirate server would actually generate a unique ID for that record and adds it to your SQL databases uh, as a, the first record. So you can always um, sort of like look up that based on a very specific record number. Let me actually show that to you in here. Let's go to the pirate telemetry system and then go to the SQL schema, no SQL, SQL schema two, and see the first one is the UUID, that's called the record ID, that pirate um, telemetry server so will regenerate for that record and will add it there when it's uh, committing these changes to your SQL databases. Um, so basically that's how it works. You can run this, uh, copy this executive somewhere on your, um, on your you know, server, uh, provide that configuration, that uh, connection URI to all the rabbits that are the pirates that are running across your team, your organization, and they'll start as the user are working, they'll start sending all this data to um, to you guys so that you can process. Uh, that's that's a very exciting uh, thing for me, especially in my in where I use pirate as well. Uh, there is a new execution model in PyRabbit. PyRabbit used to execute um, C Python commands and then. I'm sorry, used to execute Iron Python commands and we added sort of like, you know, made it work with Dynamo and C Python. But now Pirate has a new execution model. It's a unified bundle model uh, that provides many different languages. Uh, it is Iron Python, C Sharp, VB um, at the moment. And then we have Dynamo and Grasshopper through Rhino inside right now. There are a whole bunch of uh, other new bundle types that we get through. But just know that Pirate works Inside, internally completely differently from before now. Uh, there's a new feature that's called Pirate Hooks. Your extensions can have a directory that is called, let me close this. Um, you can, the, your extensions can have a directory that is called hooks inside your extension bundle. Inside that, you can throw scripts that look like this. Um, each one of them has a very specific name. They could be in Python, C Python, C Sharp, or VB.net. Uh, it's all explained in, in this document. And then, uh, these are your hooks to the event, to the application event system. So when Pirate is loading your extension and it sees that you have a script for document opened, doc opened.py, let's say, every time a Revit, that instance of Revit is opening a document, Pirate will launch that script automatically for you. So through these scripts, you can do almost anything you want, you want to do. Like for example, at my, uh, in my team, uh, I've created a document opened script that tests the uh, name of the file is being opened in Revit against our standards. And it, you notifies the user that this file that he opened seems to be a central file for a project, but it doesn't have that naming convention in it. So these are the stuff that you can really write your own scripts to start hooking up um, your scripts into the event management of, of Pyrobit. So make sure to look into this um, uh, article. And then if you go under the developer docs, you can go under the sort of like here and creating your first hook. And this article will take you through how to set up your first hook, and it gives you an example of like, you know, when, how to sort of like prompt for the view name, read the current active view name and prompt for it and stuff like that. Um, so this is also a very, very exciting feature in, in Pyrobit that I'm, that I really uh, have been working on really hard for it uh, to make this work. It's, it's, uh, it's very helpful in team, in team settings. As I mentioned, the new execution model comes with a new bundle model. Uh, there's no change need to, to be done to your, uh, Iron Python scripts or um, Iron Python scripts, basically. But for every other script type, if you had C sharp scripts and stuff like that, um, uh, private bundles need to include a bundle the YAML file inside them that sort of like exp uh, explains all this uh, stuff about the um, about what's happening inside that and what the requirements for that bundle. Uh, to take you through it, I'm going to go to the developer docs and look at the bundle metadata. Bottom of the data is very similar to what we, use, we used to use inside the R Python scripts that provide the title global variables, and this is all explained on, at the top of this article. Um, but it provides a unified way of uh, providing that information for all the languages. Uh, so if you go inside it, a typical bundle file might look like this. You will have a title, and it's in YAML format, so you have a title, 
the name of that. And then uh, some of these features are language, uh, sort of like language, they, so they're smart about language. So you can specify the title, but you can specify, specify different languages for, for that title. This is the feature that probably is gonna use to translate all the tool names and the different help you arise on all that kind of stuff, authors, and you can go through the context directives that we had before. And uh, there's a new page that talks about the private context, like for example, the zero doc, if there was a selection required for your tool. Uh, there's a whole new set of um, um, context uh, variables that are available specifically when it comes to uh, requirement for active views, like your tool needs to be needs to be only working on a 3D view, you can now request that through the context. And then if the uh, active 3D view, if a 3D view is not active, your tool will not be active in the user interface. And then the liquid templating uh, feature that's inside the bundles that you can sort of like create um, a, a key inside the parent bundle of your extension and then reuse it like this inside um, your uh, sort of like all the other tool bundle files. It makes really it makes it very easy to push all these like URLs for help or other stuff that are sort of like typical across uh, a lot of tools. Like for example, the author. Author is kind of like that. So if you define author as one time in here, you can use it on all your all your bundles. So make it make sure to take a look at this article as well. It's these are incredibly important. These are the new changes that are happening in Pyramid. Um, C sharp bundles used to the C sharp scripts are part of the uh, Pyramid bundles used to be compiled when Pyramid was launching. That's not the case anymore. Pyramid will not launch those. Will not compile those scripts anymore. Uh, Pyramid will compile these scripts at runtime. Uh, so when you are actually executing the the command, so so they're kind of like Python scripts now. Um, you can go under, like I have this part of the development tab that I'm sort of like using to show you for the, uh, for the tests, but let's say test C sharp, C sharp script. So if it launches, it shows me a prompt. You have some uh, uh, features available to you for the output window and sort of like the logger and all that kind of stuff. And you can go inside this script and make some changes to it. You even have access to the emoji system inside the output window. I just closed it. Let me actually open it again. Like this, and then see so you can, you know, print emojis and stuff from your output window as well. Close that. And then the same thing for Visual Basic scripts. Um, they are also the same and uh, they get executed every time. So you can change that C-sharp script while Revit is running and just click on it again and Pyramid recompiles and launches it, launches it for you. Um, there is a new tab colorizer in, in PyRabbit. Um, so if you go through the settings, and then kudos to Parallax team for creating the actual like more complex um, color tab, uh, sort of like add-on. Uh, if you want that, get that, because it has a lot more features than PyRabbit has. Part of its sort of like feature is very minimal. It's just meant to uh, give you the basic differentiation between the documents that you have open. But if I have this option active, uh, PyRabbit marks the documents with this and then the families with this, with this sort of like pattern. And then you can see that there are two different colors sitting on top of this. There's no configuration for, for colors, um, the actual selection of the colors. I'm sort of like keeping that based on the uh, PyRabbit theme, but this feature also is available in PyRabbit. There's a new bundle type that's called the invoke button. Thank you, thanks to um, Ali Tahami that sort of like created the template and the, um, uh, uh, what is it, the proof of concept for this. Um, you can create invoke buttons. Let's, let me find that in here. Direct invoke, um, direct class invoke. Let's take a look at this. If I go inside this, there's only a bundle definition file in here and it tells Pyrobi to launch a command from another uh, assembly, which is a DLL from somewhere else inside uh, inside the Revit environment. So let me actually take you through this one. I think that's the one that I want to, wanted to show you. This is the one that's developed by Ali as the proof of concept. Yeah. So there's this DLL that's getting shipped inside this um, inside this extension, and it's there. You could place this DLL. You could place the full path of the DLL on your network somewhere, and then part of it will load that DLL inside the Revit context and will launch that uh, command for you. But that doesn't lock the actual DLL, so you can on the back uh, sort of like change that DLL. Whether Revit's are running and this command is being executed and stuff, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't lock that. And whenever you click on it, it actually uh, loads that um, script and it sort of like executes it for you. It's a very, very efficient way of distributing all these compiled tool chains that you have to your staff. Uh, you basically create all, the, all these DLLs in one single spot, 
keep him updated. And then the, through the private interface, you create uh, shortcuts into those um, commands that he has. Uh, the runtime, the execution system is very smart about it. So it knows uh, where to find that I external command type of class that you have defined inside the assembly. And it would sort of like launch that for you. As you noticed, I didn't have any command class defined in the bundle uh, type of this because there's only one and the pirate can't find it. So start playing with these and um, I think I think you're gonna like it. There's a new bundle type that's called the dot content bundle. So now you can have you can place families inside the bundle and you can place those through the user interface and they can be um, version specific. Like this is the version that works with 2020. Uh, Pirate is smart about uh, grabbing those and placing them there. And then there's uh, sort of like the main one and then there's a the config one. Just, just like when you shift click on a command and launch a different script or the configuration for that command, um, you can place shift click on a uh, uh, content bundle and paste, place a different family. So if I normally click on this, I can start placing a family in here. And if I, go here again and then shift click on it, a different version of that family gets placed. And it's smart about like the Revit version that's running. So it doesn't do all these like weird conversions of the old file formats and stuff like that. So play with that. Uh, there's a URL button bun bundle because you know I noticed that I did it myself a lot that I had like a lot of shortcuts and stuff to other things in like in the big internet. Uh, World Wide Web. Um, for those, there is a new hyperlink, the .URL content, that you don't really have to do anything. You don't have to create a script to open a URL. You basically just define that hyperlink inside the bundle uh, metadata file, and uh, it takes, whenever you click on it, Pirate understands this and will open that URL for you. It actually runs a lot faster and it's a lot more efficient because it doesn't have to use uh, Iron Python or C Python and stuff like that. Um, as I mentioned, there's a visual basic buttons. You can uh, throw a script at VB inside your uh, inside your uh, bundle. So uh, if I select these, I don't have to select this because I have uh, created context on these uh, on these scripts that require a wall and a text node to be selected for them to be active, just as a test of this context system. But you can launch this, and this is a command that's been created in, so as in Visual Basic, and it runs and it has access to the output window and stuff as well. Ruby buttons, the scaffolding is there. Nobody really, as far as I know, uses Ruby. If you do, help me out, send me scripts and stuff like that, and I'll develop the, uh, the kernel for it. Uh, the uh, Grasshopper bundles, make sure that if you are aware of the uh, Rhino Inside project, make sure that you launch the Rhino. It works just like Dynamo. You kind of have to launch it first for the DLLs and the environment to be loaded, and then you can use the Pyravid tool, the Pyravid to sort of like distribute those. This might change in the future. I'm working with uh, McNeil and the uh, amazing developers behind the Rhino Inside project to sort of like make this more straightforward, uh, make it easier for you guys to launch it, but you can now launch a Grasshopper script. Um, just like this, a grasshopper script and an optional graphs grasshopper script inside your bundle. So if I click on this, it'll launch it, and I do a selection, and it does something that this script really doesn't do anything in this example. But you can see that you know it runs with no errors using the uh, Inspire Inside engine, and it has this black dot in front of it. So if you, you can even shift click on these commands and run the alternative script. Um, so now each one of these pirate bundles, because there's a unified bundle, you can um, use this shift system to sort of like change the behavior of that, whether it's a script or it's, it's a, uh, I don't know, it's a, um, a family that's being placed or it's a grasshopper um, a script that's been executed and stuff like that. Um, I mentioned there's a lot more information about the context, the, the, uh, much newer context types that you can place and you can combine them together. Like you can request that the context has to be that a 3D view has to be active and a wall needs to be selected for, me, for my tool to be able to, um, to activate. There's a new renumber tool. The renumber tool is here. I'll make uh, videos about all of these, but the renumber tool helps you renumber uh, spatial elements in Revit. Uh, in this example, I'm going to rename. I'm use. I'm going to use it to rename doors by room. So if I click on this door, uh, it knows the association that it has with the door, and it renames it for me because it doesn't have any other rooms that are associated with that door. If I click on this door, there are two rooms associated with it. So it asks me to sort of like select the which side of the room that I want. So if I click on this, it says 25A. It already understands that that room has a different uh, door. When I click on this, that's a 25B, and then 22A, 22B, 22C click on this again, it wants to know which room, and I say 22D. So it's smart about like these namings and stuff like that. And you can use it to renumber your spaces, doors, windows, and walls, and stuff like that. And it asks you for like all the other stuff, it actually asks you for a starting number. Like if I say, I don't know, let's say rooms, it asks you for, what is the starting number? And say 150, and then it activates those. And you can see as I click on these, it'll start uh, sort of like marking those rooms that are completed um, using, that, uh, using that feature. So that's the new tool that's available. 
And then there's some improvements into the uh, into the global variables inside the scripts, like authors and author are kind of the same thing. You can specify more authors in a list and it'll show up in the tooltip. Uh, thanks to, there's a show linked file tool available. Thanks to Alex Melnikov, uh, Melnikov, sorry. Uh, the, there are new tools for saving families selectively. It actually gives you an option to select the, the uh, sort of like to check the families that you want and save those. They're here, save families. And then um, you can go through the filtering of keep mirrored. So if I go under filter, uh, actually, let me select a bunch of objects, filter, keep mirrored. It only keeps the mirrored elements in your selection. Select the topmost group when you have nested groups and stuff like that, and you have one of them selected. Uh, there are a couple of improvements to the, uh, to the uh, sort of like the logging system and whatnot. Make sure to look at the private script facilities. Uh, I'm gonna show this to you here very quickly. Uh, Pirate Python script facilities, and you can see that the logger, the script logger that is available to you guys now has two uh, extra methods called success and deprecate. So deprecate message kind of looks like that, success looks like that, so you can use those inside your own script as well. Uh, and then the commands, this is an experimental feature, uh, don't, don't go crazy over it, but the commands now have access to their own button in the UI. So if I click on this button, test uh, where is it? Test UI button. Uh, see, I can print those objects. I have access to the add windows ribbon button in here. So if you want to be able to swap the icon of that button, depending on the execution and sort of like the conditions of the command, you can do that inside the uh, Python commands now. Uh, there's a new option for persistent engine. I'll get to this in the future. This is a bit of system only. This is directly there to support uh, the non-modal uh, windows that's coming uh, is going to come up like the uh, sort of like the keynote manager. They're going to look like uh, this. So if I persistent engine, so I'll have a window like this, and I click an action, and I can go and place a keynote, and you can see that that window is non-modal, and it can continue working on this in here. I have the features built in, and I have it uh, tested and everything, and you can click on this, and it changes the title, and you can click on it again, and it places the keynotes. For me. So the keynote manager will eventually uh, sort of like look like this and will be uh, completely um, non-modal. Um, and then stuff like miscellaneous and updates and stuff like that that you can go through and take a look at. Um, there's a lot that we covered in this in this video. Um, everything that we talked about is placed inside this new home. Make sure to take a look at this before you actually start asking questions on the Pirate blog. I've worked for for many, many months on getting this ready uh, for you guys in a way that's sort of like descriptive and has enough information and whatnot, especially when it comes to the new features. If you are managing the private for your environment, there's a lot of information here about the distribution model, the use of the CLI, and how to deploy private inside your organizations, the scripts that you have, the links to the dependencies. Um, it takes you through how to create your scripts, how to create functions inside a PowerShell script to sort of like do different things like this function will clone PyRabbit and this function will install the extensions and this one and then the orchestration of the, all these commands and whatnot to configure and install PyRabbit. It takes you through um, sort of like uh, keeping the development updated and the core update feature that's inside the, uh, the update system and then the collection of the data, use of the telemetry system and how the configuration works and stuff like that and uh, sort of like, you know, uh, other links. Like you can own, you can develop, you can deploy the private core only without any tools just to be able to use the telemetry, the application telemetry uh, system for Pyrobit as well. So make sure to take a look at all these features in there. The last thing that I wanted to show you guys is a uh, uh, sort of like the extension. If you clone the Pyrobit repository and you're a developer and you want to work with all these developers, for this example, I'm going to go through the Pyrobit dev actually apologize for that, private extensions, uh, dev hooks. This is the uh, development uh, extension that sort of like tests the hook system. That's how, that's how it looks like basically. There's a hooks in here and there are a whole bunch of scripts that I've created for all these ones. I'm gonna get rid of all these and just keep this, uh, this one for now, uh, view activated. And I'm gonna close this. I'm gonna go here to extensions and I'm gonna activate that private hooks extension. Oop, actually it was act activated apparently. Let's see if I had anything on the desktop. I do not think so. Okay, let's go and activate it again. Something might have been off in my configuration command. Okay, let's enable that extension.
Okay, so see, as I changed the view, it created this new script on, on my desktop, and it recorded that view activated here with a whole bunch of uh, sort of like stuff in it. Um, and if you look at that script, that's basically the script. It, uh, it has a hook slugger module that's inside, that provided inside the same extension. And it's all described in that article that I have for you guys um, to sort of like log all these records to that file on the desktop and you can grab the information from the event arguments. Um, make sure to look at, take a look at these. There are safer methods to get all this information, but the event arguments information is provided as part of that uh, global variable to your uh, scripts. One of the last things that I want to mention is that Pyravit C Python is a lot more powerful now. I actually disabled the Pyravit dev extension accidentally. I apologize for that. That's what that's what I did. Too many devs in there. Okay. Um, so Pyravit C Python, this test C Python command now has access to almost all the global variables that the iron python command have access to and you can import the base part of it inside the inside the script i'm going to keep working on this and make it even more powerful so sort of like there's no uh, there's no troubles between all these two so you can all these global variables that we talked about and they're described in the documentation that i'll show you they are available to your um to your uh, python scripts uh the sys.host is not available anymore. Uh, this is replaced by the standard Revit that we use on our Python script, so you can just grab it from there, or you can just say uh, import PyRevit from your PyRevit import Revit, and I'm uh, collecting all the selection and stuff like that. So if I go here and I make a selection and I go here and run that C Python, uh, I've uh, sort of like customized the C Python engine for PyRevit uses, the Python the not engine. You can see that it lists all the walls, and it's also UTF-8 compatible. So you can start uh, creating your own scripts in UTF and actually not worry about placing that UTF tag on the, where did it go? Okay, and not worry about placing this UTF information in a top of your, your file or not. Pyrobit will always read this file as UTF and it will execute that. Just make sure that it's saved in UTF so you have all these characters and you can do whatever you want to do with the different languages and stuff like that in it. And you can see that I'm running um, like 3.7.2. The, so the configuration system is still the same. You go through the settings and you go through the Pyrobit core and you pick the, the C Python engine that you want to run on. That part hasn't really changed, and I don't think it's going to change in the future because you know these are being loaded in the Revit context, and it's really hard to um, rework it to work differently. The Python is the same. Just add that to this uh, any the, the sort of like any of your Python scripts, and the C Python uh, engine will run that for you. And then just to show you an example of like how these will behave in a different uh, on your telemetry server. Let's say I want to run the um, go here and run the content bundle and then uh, run the C Python as an example and maybe run a hyperlink as well and also maybe do a selection in this model and run the C sharp script as well. So it compiles it, runs it and everything. You can change this script live within Revit environment and it would run it for you. I'm going to pause this for a second, and you can see here that I've gone five different records coming from different engine, content engine, C Python engine, hyperlink engine, uh, an event that we, when we switch the view to a different view, and then we executed the C Sharp script after that. So all this information can be collected through the, um, through the telemetry now. Um, I'm going to stop it at this point. I'll let you play with these features between now and the final version of the 4.7 that's coming up. Uh, be, stay in touch. Any of you that actually use Notion, uh, you'll have access to comment on any of these topics that are in, uh, uh, article that are here. If you have a Notion account, uh, just log in and select something and start commenting and stuff like that. Um, it's a very, very easy application, I, and I highly um, sort of like urge you to start using Notion if you have um, if you have any need to write online documentation and sort of like your own notebooks and tables and knowledge bases within your companies uh, and stuff like that. It's a great, great uh, framework to use. Um, it's been a, it's been, it's been a, it, it, it has made my life a lot simpler 
uh, and I, you know, sort of like made the decision to move all this private information inside this workspace and just share that uh, workspace public with you guys. You can see all these uh, URLs or Notion URLs, but that's completely fine. I've created um, uh, public URLs that are sort of like directly will take you through uh, the the important pirate resources. Um, you'll you'll see those here and there. You don't really need to know about them. You can just share whatever you want to do. But like for example, docs that pirate lab labs. .io will directly takes you to the um, to the documentation, the developer documentation. This is the URL that uh, is saved inside the tools inside the Pirate environment. So when you click on it, if I make ch any changes to the location of this document and stuff like that, it won't affect you guys at all. You'll always uh, have this public URL that gets rerouted to this page um, inside this. So it's uh, sort of like future proof. If we decide to change this documentation framework and go somewhere else, those URLs will still work in your tools. Um, and then the rest of it, just stay in touch on Twitter. Pirate has a new Twitter account. Uh, stay in touch, sort of like follow this. I'll publish all the new information in here. And then uh, anything else, yeah, follow the roadmap. Um, all the new features, you can come in and comment and stuff like that if there's anything you wanna see. Uh, don't go crazy over it right now with the commenting and whatnot. I'm just being honest with you. Like it's only me right now that's taking care of this. I am really seeing, I'm really looking forward and waiting for you guys to join this community and start uh, contributing to the core and make Pirate better together, especially when it comes to these stuff like documentation, translation of the Pirate. I've started translating Pirate uh, into different languages and uh, sort of like we have created this online uh, Airtable table with uh, the basic language languages that are supported by Revit, and I've actually added the Bulgarian and uh, Arabic and Farsi languages as well. Farsi, it's my mother tongue language, and I'm going to go through it and start translating those. Um, Arabic, I'm using friends help. Bulgarian is uh, is done by one of the guys that actually requested this. Amazing job! He has gone through all the 187 tools and has translated those, and I'm going to go through and sort of like add those. And you can see this checkbox for the ones that I've already committed to the code. Uh, for the full version, I'm really hoping that all the tools will be translated into all the different uh, supported languages. And then uh, what else? That's pretty much it. There's a new bundle shelf coming on. I'm working on the concept. There would be a sort of like a gallery of all these different bundles that you could use uh, for your own usage. So if you want to just share a single bundle, a single tool that you have created with no extensions and whatnot, don't want to deal about deal with um, uh, sort of like Git repos and all that kind of stuff, you can just send it to me and I'll place it in here. And it would be an archive link and people can download it in here and load it in their uh, private environment. Um, so that's that. And then the blog that we talked about, uh, I'm working with Notion to get this blog feature to have a uh, RSS feed that you can uh, sort of like um, subscribe to. And then there's an FAQ that I'm being filled. Um, so I'm starting to fill in with like installers and whatnot. If you see any sort of like these are the places that you should really should go. And then the reporting of the new issues, it gives you all the information about like what to do when you're you know, reporting a new issue. And that's pretty much it. I'm gonna stop it from here. Um, let me know if you have any other questions on the um, the best place to get me uh, is the is the Twitter. That's the one that I check the most. It has the the best interface in terms of like being able to chat with you guys and whatnot. Uh, the YouTube channel is sort of like reserved for all the tutorials and whatnot. It's hard to respond to those comments and taking care of those, especially through the app that's on the phone. Twitter is 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 my to be honest with you the preferred method to sort of like uh, be in touch with you all. Uh, you can message the private. Um, uh, channel directly, or you can message me at, um, at the Twitter that I have um, in there. And my information is actually placed here as well. So if you go here, it'll take you to my website and the, the part of it, this is the old part of it blog that will get rerouted into the new place. And then my Twitter handle is also here as well if you wanna uh, message me directly. Um, so that's pretty much it. I'm really excited for this release. Thank you for being support of part of it. To all the people that have been supported uh, part of it um, uh, with their pull requests, anybody that's listed on this pull request list, the closed ones here, thank you so much for supporting part of it. Anybody that's listed on the part of it, um, sponsor channel, which is, oops, which is the, um, the Patreon page, anybody that supports the uh, project financially, thank you so much. Um, part of it really helps me be faster and create better tools on the Revit environment uh, and just be more productive and create like amazing tools and know how my users are working with Revit and collecting information and all that kind of stuff. I'm really hoping that uh, these features that we have developed as part of the uh, 4.7 better release excites you and you'll like them and sort of like start giving back your comments and hopefully get inside the core and start developing and making changes and adding your own features and whatnot. 
Uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. We'll talk soon.